slivers. They're one of Magic the Gathering's most iconic creature types. Unlike angels and demons that you can find in a number of games, slivers truly belong to Magic the Gathering. Now, there's an interesting note about slivers in that they didn't originally exist in their current form. In fact, they were created in a set that never really existed. Greetings, owners of fine luxury cardboard rectangles. We are here today to talk about the origin of the sliver creature type. Now, we're not gonna be talking about the storyline lore history of slivers, so we're not gonna be talking about how Volrath transported the slivers to Wrath out of kinship for their metamorphic capabilities. No, we're gonna talk about where they actually came from and the very cool and funky idea that originally spawned the idea of slivers and would lead to their final step, their final evolution that we actually saw on magic cards. So it all starts with the design of a set called Astral Ways. Now you may think to yourself, wait a minute, I know all the magic expansions, I've never heard of Astral Ways. That's because in the most technical sense, Astral Ways was a very fan created set. It was created by somebody who was a fan of Magic the Gathering, but wasn't officially a designer for Magic the Gathering. Now this individual did get hired by Wizards of the Coast to be a magic designer. And when he was hired, they purchased the Astral Way set design from him. So it's it's a pretty cool idea to think about being a fan designer, coming up with your own set, Wizards of the Coast going, you know what, you got a job and we'll buy what you've designed off of you as well. We'll take the rights to that too at the same time. So that is a very nice, feel. it must be a really nice feeling. Anyhow, I'm sure you wanna know more about how Slivers came to be. So let's talk about the inspiration behind Astral Ways and what led to the creation of Slivers in the first place. The designer of the Astral Ways set really liked the card Plague Rats. Now, for anybody who doesn't know what Plague Rats is, let's quickly go over that. Plague Rats is a card from Alpha, from the very beginning of Magic the Gathering. It's one black and two colorless mana. It is a, obviously, summon rats. Its power and toughness are each equal to, under current magic terminology, asterisk, asterisk. But on the old school magic, it was X, X, because they used to use X's. So, the flavor text says the X's below are the number of plague rats in play, counting both sides. Thus, if there are two plague rats in play, each has power and toughness too. And the flavor text says, should you a rat to madness tease, why even a rat may plague you. And that is an actual, like, real-world quote from literature. So that's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And you may notice, if you've been playing Magic for a while, that we've actually seen a number of variations of these rats that get bigger as there are more rats in play. But you'll notice that this one doesn't seem to have what a lot of those rats have. A lot of those rats have the extra text saying, you can play any number of these rats. Now, that's how plagues were, Plague Rats was originally intended. Because at the very, very beginning of Magic, there were no deck restrictions. So you could actually build a deck with just swamps and plague rats. If you could acquire enough plague rats, you could literally build an entire rat deck. And it would play very similarly to the new school rat decks. But obviously they came along with restrictions and that changed how plague rate rats operated. Now, the creator of Slivers liked the idea of these creatures that play off of each other, but he wanted to have more interaction and more creatures. So he actually came up with a concept. For the set Astral Ways, the idea was that there was actually two different realms of existence, two different universes, two different realms of existence. The details on this, admittedly, are a bit sketchy. You have to understand this comes from ancient, ancient magic past in the mid 90s, and records of this sort of thing aren't easy to come by. So it's not sure whether it was two worlds, two universes, but what is known is there was an astral doorway that connected these two worlds. Now, the villain, and the villain may have been a demigod. The way the story is told, there's a couple of different ways where they could be demigods involved, gods involved, or just high-level, legendary-style individuals. There is the villain, the enemy of the storyline, and his goal 
is to open the astral doorway, either to allow, and this, this part wasn't very clear, either to allow the denizens of the other world to invade the main story world, or to allow the main st story world to invade the astral, the, go through the astral door and attack this other realm. It wasn't really clear. Either way, the point of the goal is that the villain is trying to use this door to cause havoc. So the hero of the story, who is sometimes portrayed as a regular champion and sometimes as a god, goes ahead and sets out to destroy the astral gateway. And in doing so, he actually rends himself asunder. The hero, this, I assume god, just because it feels like it would need to be a god, this god destroys the astral doorway, but in doing so becomes undone and is broken apart into a thousand shards of himself. A thousand slivers. So that is where the sliver creature type was actually technically born in the astral ways set as the concept that these were actually chunks of the god being who was responsible for the destruction of the astral door. And to me, that's pretty flavorful. I mean, if you look at what slivers are concepted as now, for those of you who don't know, slivers are concepted as insectile hive mind creatures kind of similar to ants where they need to have or bees where they need to have some sort of monarch some sort of queen reigning over them right that's the idea of slivers they are insects part of a hive but they're also shapeshifters that are able to draw on evolution adaptations of each other so if one sliver evolves a mutation all slivers are able to take advantage of it. And a really easy way to understand this is to take a look at the winged sliver from Tempest. This is actually Tempest is where a lot of these astral cards ended up. So winged sliver is one blue, one colors for a one, one, and all slivers gain flying. So every sliver, because there's all kinds of different slivers, all gain flying. They all gain the ability to sprout these wings and fly around. And you can see that evidenced in the flavor text too, where Gerard is lamenting, everything around here has cut a deal with gravity. So these are these are insect hive beasts that share a consciousness sort of, but on their own are not really um, anything more than just scavengers. On their own, they're just kind of red. It's, it's like an ant without a colony, right? They're, they're kind of lost. In a group, they can still be a menace, but overall, they need to have a hive leader. So they're led by the Sliver Queen. Now, the sli we're gonna, we'll take a look at the finalized version of the Sliver Queen, and then we will talk about the evolutions to get to the Sliver Queen, because this isn't, this isn't the Sliver Queen's first form. Remember, as I said, the Slivers were originally chunks of a god that had been shattered. So the Sliver Queen is one of every color. So one white, one blue, one black, one red, one green. And as an interesting note, it's actually the very first multicolored magic card ever made. Well, ever made for an actual expansion. If you count the 19, like 96 world championship card that they made like one of, then technically in the most technical way, that's the first gold card that is all five colors. But Sliver Queen, really, I mean, that's the one that most people are gonna know. And to me, it really counts because it showed up in an actual magic set instead of being a special promotional reward. So the Sliver Queen, interestingly enough, it says Sliver Queen counts as a sliver on the card because back in the day, creatures would only have one type and they considered legend a creature type back in the day. So instead of considering it like a super type where you'd have legendary creature and then you would have the types like Minotaur, Goat or whatever, legend was considered a creature type. So there was ways to abuse that actually in the old rules. And so as a result, with legend being the creature type, they also had to have the line there to say Sliver Queen counts as a sliver so that the Sliver Queen would also benefit from all these different slivers that give abilities because there's a ton of these ability granting slivers. Now Sliver Queen's ability is pay two colorless, put a sliver token into play, treat this as a one one colorless creature. And the flavor text says her children are ever part of her. And the, the artwork is this crazy Ron Spencer artwork where you can see her. She's in some kind of domed cave, presumably somewhere on Wrath. She's a gigantic insectile beast with massive scythe razors for hands. Unlike most slivers, which tend to only have the one blade, she's got two massive blades and multiple stingy tails. She's a pretty fierce looking beast. And at 7-7, seven, seven, 
she would tower over mortal man. Now, the original form of Sliver Queen was actually something wildly different. It was the mind of the controller. So the controller was the name of that hero god who was fragmented and smashed apart into all these slivers upon the destruction of the Astral Gateway. So the Sliver Queen originally was the mind that was somehow intact on its own. All kinds of different parts of the controller. They had like mind of the controller, heart of the controller, but mind of the controller is what actually became the Sliver Queen. And in its initial form, it was one of all colors, just like the Sliver Queen, 7-7, seven, seven, just like the Sliver Queen. It had trample as well, which makes sense for something that big. And it had all slivers get plus one, plus one. So that was the original. Now, I mean, if you compare that to newer slivers, you've got your you've got a five cost sliver that gives all other slivers equal bonus to the number of slivers you have out. So giving all slivers plus one, plus one is pretty weak in all honesty. That's the level of a muscle sliver. And that's not that impressive. So they decided to step it up and go, you know what? We're going to take the mind of the controller and we're going to keep the concept of it being the hive mind because the slivers went from being fragments of a being to being just insects that are part of a hive. So you're going to have this hive mother, the sliv the sliver queen, and we're going to take away that plus one plus one concept and we're going to replace it with her birthing slivers. So the initial version of the sliver queen kept trample. So it was a 7-7 seven, seven trampler, but it cost three colorless to make a 1-1 one, one sliver token. And what they wanted to do was emphasize the idea that the sliver queen worked by creating lots of little sliver troops, little sliver babies to do her bidding. So in an attempt to make her less combat oriented, they removed trample and they reduced the cost of making the sliver token. So she lost trample and it went from three colors to make a sliver down to two colorless to make a sliver, which I think, I think Sliver Queen with three mana to make a sliver still would have been perfectly fine in all honesty. Sliver Queen is a very potent card that and the price of the card has climbed up quite a bit. Ever since Modern Horizons came out with another wave of slivers, it pushed the price of Sliver Queen through the roof and she is on the reserve list. So we won't be seeing her coming back. She's on the not to be printed list. Now to me, the original idea behind the slivers is actually way, way, way cooler than what the slivers became. And I know people are in love with the slivers and some, of, some people are gonna be like, no way, I love them as my little insects. But I have a feeling that if slivers came out with the original concept and they were all fragments of a god being, you would still have all the same abilities still have the same way to play it, so you would probably still feel the same. And in all honesty, it would be even cooler to find new slivers on different planes because they would be fragments of that god being that got scattered throughout the multiverse when he shattered into fragments. How amazing is that? I thought that was a really cool, just a really cool story about the slivers origins, and I wanted to cover that before we went more in depth with more sliver lore, and it was it was a special nod as well to uh, one of the fans of the channel, Richard Lash, who has done quite a bit recently, and I appreciate it. So I thought it'd be a nice treat to throw out some sweet sliver lore, but not the type you would expect. So let me know what you guys think in the concept. Uh, I'm not thinking the concept, sorry. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Is this concept of a god being fractured into all these different miniature beings that all have powers that play together more interesting to you than the sliver concept? Do you like the sliver concept with them as insects? What would you prefer to see in Magic the Gathering? Obviously at this point, it's set in stone what slivers are gonna be and there's no going back. But I do like the idea. It's very flavorful to chew on the concept of a fragmented god being being the sliver. So let me know your thoughts. A big thank you to all my patrons and channel members. Thank you very much for supporting the work that I do. And I welcome anyone else who wishes to join my Patreon or channel membership. Feel free to do so. And remember, my friends. Together, we're the sixth color of magic.